The man looked like an amiable Bigfoot. The woman was obviously English. She had all the qualities of Boadicea, Elizabeth I, and Margaret Thatcher rolled into one. It wasn't a pretty sight. The figure of a sexless youth was frozen in mid-skip with a silly grin on its stone lips. I recognized the guy. It was the Nobel Prize winner from the country whose name I couldn't pronounce. Excuse me, didn't I see your picture in the news? You're that Nobel Prize winner from some unpronounceable Eastern European state. Yes, that is me, in person. I don't want to worry you, but have you had any threats on your life? You know, mysterious phone calls, letters made up of headlines cut from the newspaper. I don't know what you're talking about. Have you seen a clown? I beg your pardon? The clown. A guy in funny pants. Have you seen him? My pants are from England. Marx and Spencer. They are a pleasure and a comfort to wear with much support. I'm real glad to hear that. You know, it's good to know you Nobel Prize winners are human too. In my country, do people make do with string and egg cartoons? For pants? For everything. Oppression is the mother of ingenuity. Do you know a guy called Plantau? I don't know anybody in Paris. Oh, well, this guy's dead anyhow. Why do you ask me about dead men? I have seen enough of that to last me a lifetime. I'm, uh, sure you have. Do you recognize this man? He calls himself Khan. Yes. I know this man. Why do you carry his photograph? I'm a private detective. What's your interest in Khan? He is an enemy of my people. You know he's a killer? Of course. Amongst other things. Would you help me investigate Khan? That is not possible. My instructions are to observe. I cannot jeopardize my position as an honored guest of this country's government. Thanks for your help. Goodbye. The sign on the door read 21. The sign on the door read 22. If the tailor's description was correct, this was the killer's room. Just a minute, monsieur. What's your problem? No problem, if you cooperate. What do you want? Just a routine security check. Nothing to worry yourself about. Oh, well, all right. Search him, Flap. You bet. Hey, knock it off. Get off, you big ape. Nothing, Guido. Zilch! Our apologies, monsieur. What? I had to report you to the authorities. Round here, we are the authorities. You want I should break his arms? No. Let him go, Flap.
Hanging from a brass hook was a key and a plastic tag. I want some information. Who are you? The police? I'm conducting a private investigation. Ah, I know only too well what you mean. That is one of the drawbacks of the catering business. When people book into an hotel, they leave their morals at home, no? I've just been manhandled by a gorilla. Yes? I do not see any signs of a gorilla. No, not a real gorilla. It was a guy who looked like a gorilla. It happened right out front of this building. Let me get this quite clear. Are you complaining or bragging? I want to know what you're going to do about it. The scrawny one has a gun. I suggest you contact the police. Can't you do anything about them? What goes on in the streets of Paris is hardly my responsibility. Aren't you concerned that your guests are being intimidated by gangsters? No one else has complained, monsieur. Did they steal anything from you? Well, no. They didn't find what they were looking for. What was that? I don't know. I don't think they did either. Do you have a guest by the name of Khan? No, monsieur. Perhaps you would care to check the register. The man who calls himself Khan has a scar on his left cheek. Vraiment? I tell you, I do not know a man named Khan. Maybe not, but I noticed a change in his expression when I mentioned the scar. Do you recognize the man in this photograph? Yes, monsieur. That man is one of our guests. What name? <laughs> I cannot tell you that. About the key hanging on the hook over there. Oui, monsieur. Which room is it for? Number 21. Is that room taken? No. The guests checked out this morning. I'd like to check into room 21. That is not possible. How come? You said it was vacant. It is reserved for another guest. Rats. No, monsieur. Dutch. Thanks for your help, buddy. Hi there, ma'am. Well, hello. What can I do for you? I'm looking for a man. You disappoint me, my dear. For one foolish moment, I thought. But never mind. Aren't you going to tell me your name? George. George Stobart, ma'am. How sweet! I once had a stable boy called George. I am Lady Piermont. The common reaction is to kneel and stutter, but it's not obligatory. A real lady? I mean, you're an honest-to-God aristocrat? Oh, I don't know about that. Few of my ancestors are honest, not even to God. I can trace my family back to the Normans, but don't let that intimidate you, George. Beneath that impressive pedigree, I'm just flesh and blood. The blood may be blue, but the flesh is the plump beef of old England, so to speak. You appear distracted, George. Is there any way I can help you? I'm looking for a murderer. Good heavens! You're a private detective. That's correct, ma'am. What's the term you Americans use? It's on the tip of my tongue. I believe what you're thinking of is Dick. Precisely. Have you come across a man who calls himself Khan? I am familiar with only one person named Khan. Genghis Khan, the legendary Mongol barbarian chieftain? No, darling. Kevin. Kevin Khan? I never heard of him. I'd be most surprised if you had, darling. He's a pharmacist in Hemel Hempstead. Organizes fundraising for the Rotarians. Lovely man. Does he have a scar on his cheek? I really wouldn't know, sweetie. Are you here in Paris on vacation? No, darling, I'm on holiday. I needed to get away after Algy's funeral. I didn't realize you were mourning the loss of a loved one. I'm not. He was my husband.
I'm sorry to hear about your husband's death. You wouldn't be if you knew him, my dear. It gave me the opportunity to take a well-deserved holiday. Daphne suggested a change of scenery. Paris, she said. A wild romance is just what you need to take your mind off the inquest. Well, the closest I came to romance was being wooed by a drunken Breton chef. I must say I was disappointed with his cock van. Not at all what I was expecting. I was thinking of cutting my holiday short, packing my bags and heading back to Hemel Hempstead. That was until last night. What happened to you last night? I was stricken, Mr. Sturbot. Cupid's arrow has cleft my bosom. They couldn't really miss. It was just as I'd always imagined it should be. The intimacy of candlelight, romantic music tinkling across the room, and then a stranger's glance. Those brooding eyes, that suave manner, those tight trousers. He was the man I'd been waiting for all my life. I'm glad he finally turned up after all these years. Ah, but it wasn't to be. He was merely toying with my affections. And if I ever catch up with him, he's dead. Who was the guy who led you on? His name is Merlin. Would you distract the clerk while I borrow a key? Are you asking me to aid you in a criminal act, darling? Oh, no. It's the key to an empty room. And why, may I ask, do you wish to gain access to an empty room? Do you plan to squat? No, ma'am. Scout honor? I was never in the Boy Scouts, ma'am. Oh, you should have been. What were your parents thinking of? It's a fine way for a boy to get licked into shape. Now tell me, why do you want to get into that room? It's next to the room the killer is using. What killer? It's a long story. Do you recognize the man in this photograph? My God, it's him! That's Merlin! She represented everything I loved about the English. The lady was totally deranged. Merlin? You mean King Arthur's wizard? Good heavens, no! Monsieur Merlin is a fellow guest. He's the man I've been telling you about. That's the man who spurned me. The man you know as Merlin is a fake. What do you mean, sweetie? He's a murderer. He also uses the name Khan. I am shocked, Mr. Stobart. Shaken. I took him to be a gentleman, a man of honor. Do you know, I'd rather like to assist you in stitching him up. When did you last see Merlin? It was no more than an hour ago. He came downstairs and spoke to that clerk chappy. Something passed hands. I couldn't see what exactly. A briefcase? No, smaller than that. A bundle of papers, perhaps. The clerk put it in the hotel safe and Merlin went out. Are you sure you saw Merlin putting documents in the safe? Yes, darling. Positive. I wonder what they were. Obviously something of great importance. Yeah. I'd sure like to get my hands on whatever it is. I'll bet they had something to do with Plantow's briefcase. Has Merlin returned to the hotel? No, he hasn't. Are you going to search his room? If I could get in there, I would. And that's why you want the key? Yes, ma'am. I shouldn't think my feminine charms would be much use in this case. But a good dose of English arrogance might do the trick. I say, you there, flunky. Oui, madame. Listen carefully. You do understand English, don't you? But of course, madame. Good. I wish to deposit some jewelry for safekeeping. I understand. Are you quite certain? Oh, bien sûr, madame. Over to you, my dear.
There was no one registered under the name of Khan, but the name in the book for room 22 was Merlin. Maybe it wasn't the right room, but this was the right key. There was nothing in the wardrobe apart from a vague, lingering smell of camphor. The cabinet was empty, but it smelt of onions. No kidding, it really did. The window looked out over a narrow alley surrounded by high walls. If I wanted my shin sticking out of my shoulders, I could have jumped. Mama Stobart didn't raise no suicidal fools, though. The assassin had been too smart to leave incriminating evidence beside his bed. The bed was freshly made, and the crisp white sheets told me nothing about the killer's habits. There was nothing in the pockets of the pants. The door led back into the hall, idiot. I had the kind of feeling in my stomach that would usually send me running to the bathroom. I couldn't believe my luck when I found two items in the pockets of the pants. The first was an ordinary matchbook. No matches, no clues. The second was a pass card which read, Thomas Merlin, Gruber Electronics Corporation. The matchbook bore a pattern of swirling color and the words, Club Alamut. Hello again. Does the name on this matchbook mean anything to you? Indeed it does, for Alamut was the home of the old man of the mountains. You do not know him? No, I don't.
What now, monsieur? I'd like to retrieve something from your safe. Ah, oui, monsieur. May I see some form of identification? Uh, like what? A driving license, perhaps? I don't drive. Your passport? I don't have it with me. I could show you my operation, Scar. I'm sorry, monsieur. I must have some form of unique ID. You won't find a more unique ID than my Scar. I'm sorry. I must insist on a more traditional identification. Rats! Does this pass mean anything to you? That is Monsieur Merlin's property. That's right. Merlin the murderer. I want to see what he's left in your safe. Impossible. I cannot betray his confidence, no matter what you say he's done. You're making a big mistake. Maybe. I can live with that. Thanks for your help, buddy. Hi, ma'am. Hello, George. What can I do for you now? I found this pass in Merlin's room. So, that deceitful little man is passing himself off as an electrician, is he? Uh-huh. This guy probably has a million faces. I showed the pass to the clerk, hoping he'd give me Merlin's papers. But he wouldn't buy it. He's too scared. I'll give him something to be scared of. Follow me, George! Did you place a package from Merlin in the hotel safe? I did, madame. And did my friend here show you Merlin's identification? Indeed he did, but... What's the problem? He isn't Merlin. A mere academic detail. Give him the package. But that is against the law. I happen to be a justice of the peace, you silly man. I am the law. If he tries anything, shoot him, George. My pleasure, Lady Piermont. One moment, please. You know, I haven't enjoyed myself this much since Greenham Common. I don't know what I would have done without you, Lady Piermont. Voila, monsieur. Le manuscrit de Monsieur Merlin. Thanks. How satisfying. An Anglo-American alliance that actually worked. The clerk had given me a tightly rolled sheet of parchment. I decided not to unroll it until I was safely back in Nico's apartment. I knew this was no way to treat an ancient manuscript, but I couldn't let it fall into the hands of the goons waiting outside. Hold it right there. Search him again, Flash. Nothing, Guido. Okay, let him go. 
Excuse me. Yeah? Don't you think you have some explaining to do? Huh? I'm an American citizen and a bona fide visitor to your country. What the... You can't touch me up in the street and expect to get away with it. Get lost, creep. If the manuscript was what Flap and Greedo were after, they were going to be disappointed. I couldn't wait to get back to Nico's apartment and check it out. You're just not going to believe what I've found. It's not another part of the clown's costume, is it? It's a medieval manuscript. Khan left it in the safe at the Ubu. It's incredible. Is this what he took from Plantark? It could be, which means it's worth enough to kill for. Look there, two guys on the same horse. Oh, yeah. Maybe they couldn't afford one each. What of it? Have you ever heard of the Knights Templar? Their official seal was an image of two knights sharing a horse. Whatever this manuscript means, it's connected with the Templars. How come you know about these knights? I learned about them while writing an article on the Crusades. This guy, named Hughes de Payen, arrived one day at the court of King of Jerusalem. He offered to protect the Christian pilgrims from the displaced Muslim army. The king would be able to guarantee safe transit to Christians in the Holy Land. Safer journeys meant more pilgrims, and pilgrims meant trade and wealth. The Templars proved invaluable to the king as a mercenary army. It was said that they never asked how many the enemy numbered, just where they were. And as the years went by, the Templars grew in wealth and number. They were so rich. Even kings came to them for loans. But at the height of their power, they fell foul of the King of France. He rounded them up and turned them over to the Inquisition. Thousands of Templars were subject to torture and confessed to heresy. Of course, at the hands of the Inquisition, there wasn't much they wouldn't confess to. The last Grand Master Jacques de Molay was burned alive. But the treasure of the Knights Templar was never found. Jeez, so the treasure is hidden, waiting to be discovered? If there ever was a treasure, it's been lost for 600 years. Anyway, we're supposed to be investigating a serial killer, not a medieval treasure trove. But maybe that's what the clown and his accomplices are after. Maybe this manuscript is the key. You'd better leave it here for safekeeping. Think about it, George. One guy's already died for it, as you said yourself. Besides, that parchment is fragile. Okay, okay, I'm convinced. You keep hold of it. Let's take another look at the manuscript. Let's face it, we need help, George. Someone who knows about these things. Who do you suggest? Indiana Jones? I know a guy who specializes in medieval studies. His name is Lobino. Huh. Some stuffy old fossil who gets horny over ancient relics, I suppose. Far from it. Andre isn't the stereotypical professor you have in mind. Where can I find this Lobino guy? At the Krun Museum. I'll give you the address. There's a guy with a sword and a bull. The only mythological bull I know of is the Minotaur, but he was only half bull. I don't think I'd like to be half a bull, even if it was the bottom half. What's that object between them? It looks like a gem on top of a tripod. There's a guy working on a loom. He's weaving a carpet or a tapestry. Or a duvet cover. It's a clue to a place, I reckon. 
Somewhere famed for weaving and ships. Where folk live in barrels? It beats copper boxes. A knight with a crystal ball. Now, there's something written on the scroll beside the knight. Yes, but it's written in Latin. Per disciplinum mea lux videbis. By my teachings, you will see the light. You speak Latin? Where did you learn a trick like that? A trick? I studied law, okay? I can read Latin. Ma, you're touchy. Tell me that again. Through my teachings, you will be enlightened. There's a woman looking at her reflection in a mirror, but the reflection has three hideous faces. She reminds me of the Wicked Queen in Snow White. She was the one who said mirror, mirror on the wall, wasn't she? She made me cry so much when I was a kid, Mom carried me out of the movie theater. She didn't frighten me in the least. Like I said, I was only a kid. I didn't like the crocodile in Peter Pan either. Maybe I'll check out the Kroon Museum. I'm sure you'll find it useful, Georges. The attendant had an air of self-importance and the kind of steely eyes that never seemed to blink. Pardon me. Oui, monsieur? Are you Lobino? Oh, no. Fancy you mistaking me for him. No, I am the deputy custodian. But Lobino does work here. Work? I wouldn't go so far as to call it that. He studies here most days, but as you can see for yourself, not today. Do you know anything about the Knights of the Temple? No, sir. Not a sausage. Do you know anything about medieval manuscripts? Not me, monsieur. I am no scholar. Though people often mistake me for one. It is the uniform, I guess. They see the clothes. They are impressed. And they ask you to park their cars? They ask me to park the... No, no, no. They assume. I am an authority on the exhibits in my care. Whereas you know next to nothing about history. Of course not. All I am saying is, I am no scholar. Not like Monsieur Lobino. Do you recognize the man in this photograph? No, Monsieur. Is there any reason why I should? I guess not. Thanks for your help. It was an ancient Egyptian sarcophagus with a beautifully painted effigy of its owner on the lid. Leave it alone. That closet is over 3,000 years old. Closet? It's a sarcophagus. The totem pole looked distinctly out of place in the setting of the museum. Watch out! You will have that done on top of us! I tried to raise the glass cover of the case, but it didn't budge. The case contained two rows of silver coins. Each coin on the lower row showed a portrait of a guy with a huge nose. In the case was a spindly tripod blackened with age and pitted with rust. It was identical to the tripod pictured on the manuscript. A notice identified it as 15th century from Western Ireland. It had been found in Loch Marne 
at the site of a Knights Templar preceptory. Ireland! What's that? This tripod was found in Ireland. I will have to ask you to keep your voice down. I'm sorry, I was excited. Pardon me. Oui, monsieur? Can you give me any further information about the tripod? Certainly, monsieur. It's infamous. That tripod? That belonged to John D. What's the importance of John D.'s tripod? D was the most famous escapologist of the 16th century, the Udini of his time. Don't you mean alchemist? Escapologists use ropes, chains, and handcuffs, not tripods. Well, whatever he was, that is the tripod he used in his experiments. What kind of experiments did John D. perform with his tripod? Oh, the usual. Didn't you study chemistry at school? Yeah, but we skipped over thaumatology. Can I take a closer look at the tripod? What? Get it out of the case? Ah, uh, no! That tripod is protected by a sophisticated surveillance system. How sophisticated? A painfully loud alarm bell. How is the alarm bell triggered? By the slightest pressure on or movement of any part of the case wherein that tripod is situated. It strikes me that to call your alarm system sophisticated is, well, stretching the truth a little. It has never failed yet. The sophistication is in its simplicity. The sign on the tripod says it was found at a Templar preceptory. It does? Yeah. It doesn't mention John D. at all. Most remiss. You don't know anything about the tripod, do you? No, I don't. I never had much of a start in life, you see. I owe a little education again to my uncle. He was an optician, but he also doubled as the village school teacher. He taught me the alphabet. Well, 19 letters of it. The bottom row of the chart was uh, too small even for him to read, so he left them out. Why don't you start over and enroll for adult education? You know, I never thought of that. Do you think? If I studied art and did all my homework, I could be a professor of history? At your age? Dream on. What can you tell me about the collection of coins? A rare example of silver coinage from the reign of uh, Philippe le Bel. That little old lay buried for centuries in a field on the outskirts of Paris. They're unique. Nothing like them has been found anywhere else in Europe. Who was Philippe le Bel? You don't know. Philippe IV, the King of France. Wasn't he the guy who wiped out the Knights Templar? I have no idea, monsieur. All I know is he was King of France. I don't even know why he was called Philippe le Bel. Thanks for your help. The tripod was definitely the one on the manuscript. The Templar connection confirmed it. I was tempted to go to Ireland to check it out. Hi, Jules. I found the tripod. Where? In the museum. It belonged to the Templars. It was dug up in Ireland at a place called Loch Marne. I have heard of Loch Marne. I read an article about the cattle. Take a look for yourself. A popular gossip magazine? You read that rubbish? No, I write it.
Professor Nigel Pegram excavating the medieval castle at Loch Marne. That's strange. What? He resigned his chair at Durham University in order to devote his time to the excavation. Not only that, but he canceled the filming of a fourth series of his popular television program. This site at Loch Marne must be awful important to him. He's a professor of history, Daryl Cuckoo. All the same, I'd like to talk to this Professor Pegram. How do you feel about a trip to Ireland? Disappointed. Huh? That I won't be going. I want to follow up the Belota case. If you really think Pegram's gem is important, why don't you visit Loch Marne? On my own? I'm not so sure about that. Where is Ireland exactly? What do you know about Professor Pegram? I've seen a television program, Pegram's Past. He's written a book, The Crusader Families of Ireland. I'll bet he'd be interested in the manuscript. I'll see you later. Okay. Keep me informed if you find anything new. Several hours later, I arrived in Ireland, the Emerald Isle. I'd been lucky to get a bus from Dublin to the tiny village of Loch Marne. On the way out, the driver told me there was only one service a day. The menu was limited. It read, no food today. I didn't care. I'd lost my appetite somewhere over the Irish Sea. The lad was doing his best to express his adolescent aggression. His effort was somewhat diminished by the fringe of milk on his lightly feathered upper lip. The young red-haired guy was plainly nervous about something. Perhaps he felt threatened by the presence of a handsome dude like me. The guy with the fiddle seemed oblivious to everything except his playing. Meanwhile, everyone else in the bar seemed oblivious to him. Top of the morning to you. I beg your pardon? Well, that's what you Irish say, isn't it? Do you want something? Or are you just flaunting your xenophobia? Well, I, I was trying to be sociable. <laughs> Is it a room you're after? <laughs> that's not a bad idea. Do you have a vacancy? I could, if you don't mind waiting until the last guest checks out. No problem. When will that be? When the undertaker comes to collect him. Do you know a man called Pegram? Indeed I do. Are you a friend of his, by any chance? Oh no, I'm just trying to track him down. Me too. That son of a bitch should be locked away. Did Pegram stay here? That's right. In the best room in the house. That's the one with the bed. I'll try a glass of beer, please. Is this your first pint of real ale? Uh, well, I guess so. What's real ale, anyhow? Beer that's brewed from natural ingredients to traditional methods. It shouldn't be kept under pressure or refrigerated. And finally, 
It should have a good body and distinctive character. In other words, it's flat and warm with bits in, and it makes you fall over. Can I see Pegram's room? It's been taken by one of the brothers from the reformatory. They come every year for spiritual refreshment. That's a good one. Their idea of refreshment is a good full of stout. I wouldn't want to disturb a man of God. Especially not a big fella from the bad boy's home. I don't blame you, Mick. That brother's got muscles like a muscle man. Have you served any, uh, clowns recently? No. You're the first today. Seriously, I'm looking for a man dressed in a clown costume. Or would he be having a little white dog with a black patch over the eye? I shouldn't think so. What can you tell me about the castle? You're the second person to ask me that today. I don't know anything about the castle. It's only an old drone anyway. Who else was asking about the castle? He said he was a reporter. He was asking about the little people. I could have told him a tale or two about the little people. He might have paid me to hear what he wanted me to say. Anyway, I chucked him out on his arse. Good for you, Mick. That's the way to deal with journalists. Do you recognize this man? No, I don't. What do you want with him? I've got a score to settle. I don't want any trouble in the bar, mister. If it's a fight you're looking for, see Father Mahoney. A priest? A man of the cloth? Sure. And he teaches the boys how to box at the youth club. According to Mahoney, it develops character. Isn't that right, Pat? Didn't he teach you all the art of pugilism? Doyle. Sorry, Michael. I was miles away. What did you say? Ah, never mind. Thanks. Somehow, I'd managed to drink the thick, sweet brew. I felt strangely compelled to order another, even though my every instinct warned me against it. Excuse me. Uh, yes, sir? May I have another beer, please? Certainly, sir. Same again? Yeah, please. How is this stuff made? That's the secret of the master brewer, sir. Each barrel is lovingly manhandled in time-honored fashion, suspended on skillfully tied ropes of the finest hemp, lowered into the cellar, utilizing the forces of original gravity, like manner from heaven. Thanks. I'd been taught not to judge people by their appearance or their clothes or the length of their hair. Nobody ever said anything about runny noses. Hi there, old timer. What? Nasty cold you've got there. As soon as the words left my lips, I regretted them. Is there such a thing as a cold which isn't nasty? I put the question to Father Mahoney. Father, says I, why were we born to suffer snot? What did he say? He said, it's my reward for being out all night like a sinner. <coughs> Pious prig. Anyway, this is no ordinary cold. It is the hay fever. Polynosis? Thank you. You're not a policeman, are you? Excuse me? Police? No. I'd know it if you were. Can I buy you a beer? Very kind, I'm sure. But I don't drink the stuff Leary sells. What's wrong with it? I've seen what it can do. 
Can you tell me how to get into the castle? Don't even think about it, me bucko. Lockbarn Castle is haunted. Have you ever seen the ghost? To be sure, with me very own eyes. Can you describe the ghost? It was horrible. A wee stunted beast, long beak, straggly, flappy wings. Are you sure it wasn't a wild animal? A rabbit or a skunk or something? Skunk? In Loch Marne? That'll be the day. <gasps> no, that was a ghost, to be sure. Do you know Pegram, the archaeologist? That's the scrawny fellow who was poking around at the castle, isn't it? <gasps> no, I don't know him. Were you aware that Pegram was conducting an archaeological dig? I don't meddle in other people's affairs. They don't interest me. Do you know where I can find Pegram? I told you, I never heard of him. Ghosts don't bother me. I still want to visit that castle. You can't. It's not open to the public. There's no one around to stop me, is there? That's right. Nothing human, anyhow. I'll see you later. It was an electric glass washer. It looked even older than the barman. It was a telephone, incongruous in the rustic setting of the homely bar. It was a short piece of wire twisted into a rough circle. Hello again. What? What's that you're making? It's a necklace, me poco. Oh, sure. Made out of steel wire? <laughs> That's right. A necklace for my pretty one. When my little lover peels it round her slender neck, she'll be mine. All mine. <laughs> If I was a woman, I wouldn't think much of a wire necklace. It's not made for a woman. I've got my sights on tastier dishes than women. Flesh as smooth and tender as a maiden. Bones as soft and white as a newborn babe's. Rabbit, lad. That's what gets my juices flowing. <laughs> Ah, so you're making snares to trap rabbits. That's right. Do you have a problem with that? Damn right I do. Isn't it painful? Only if I get me fingers caught. I'm talking about the rabbits. Do they feel much pain? You bet. <laughs> I'll see you later. It was an electric pump operated by pushing a small lever. Hey, where do you think you're going? Excuse me? No customers behind the bar, ever. There was a vacant look on his cow-like face that said quite clearly, nobody home. His elbow rested on an obviously soggy piece of towel. Hi, my name's Stobart, George Stobart. Hello there, mister. What can I do for you? Do you know Professor Pegram? Do I know him? Do I know the good professor himself? No, I don't. I mean, I know who he is, but I don't know him to talk to. Do you know anything about Pegram's excavation? Only that he didn't have the right tools for the job. What he needed was shovels and a JCB. Pegram was digging for historical remains, not coal. Is that a fact? <gasps> what the hell for? Here's the science of archaeology part. 
understanding how people used to live by what they've left behind. One day archaeologists might be digging up our remains. Imagine that, Mr. O'Brien. I wonder what they'll find. Well, it won't be arrowheads and beakers. Fast food cartons and flavoured condoms, more likely. Is it true that Pegram found a valuable gem? What? First I heard of it. Where have you been, Pat? For that gem is the talk of every town from Loch Marn to Ballydoon. Nobody told me. The lucky sod. So that's why he scampered. Did anyone from the village work at Pegram's dig? I tried it myself, but that high and mighty history man called me incontinent. What a nerve. Hadn't I dug more holes than the rest of them put together? Can you tell me anything about the castle on the hill? Oh, I don't know much about anything. You should ask Mr. O'Brien here. He just joined up writing. Would you be one of them history fellows yourself? Oh no, I'm here on vacation. What's that? A vacation part. It's what the Americans call a holiday. Oh, right. In Loch Marne? You come to Loch Marne for a holiday? Sure. It's a very pretty place. Wow. Where the hell are you from, mister? California. I know it. That's where the prunes come from. <laughs> yeah. Amongst other things. Bye for now. Hello there. Uh, my name's George Stobart. Pleased to meet you, I'm sure. Hey, O'Brien. Uh, can I help you? Do you know where I can find Pegram? You're too late to meet that fella. Is he dead? Not that. But he's gone from the village. A sore point with our esteemed host, I might add. Why is Pegram's departure upset the landlord? He's lost a paying guest. That's why. More than that. There's the question of an unsettled bill. Poor Michael's seen red over the business, and I don't blame him. Can you tell me more about the landlord? Mick Leary? He's what you call a, a would-be sophisticate. The trouble is, his idea of sophistication extends as far as putting paper in the lavatory. I never worked out why he did that. It's much too dark in there to read. That's true. Have you ever run your hand over the back of the door? The graffiti is written in Braille. Do you know where Pegram has gone? I'm sorry, but I don't. He oped anchor in the dark and shipped out before the dark. Why did he do that? Who knows? A guilty conscience or a secret assignation. Whatever the reason, he'll not be missed in Loch Maybe now the fuss about the gem has died down. We can get back to normal. What can you tell me about the gem which Pegram found? Now there's a gem, which should never have been taken. A man would have to be full of greed to covet that stone. What's your interest in the jewel? You're not a reporter, are you? Oh no. Thank the Lord for that. What can you tell me about the castle, Mr. O'Brien? It's a fine sight now, isn't it? Dates back to the 10th century, you know. Most of the existing building was added much later, of course. Are the ruins open to the public? Oh no, it's much too dangerous. Anyway, there's nothing of interest remaining. Pegram thought otherwise, didn't he? Ah, but it's not difficult to get them history boys excited, is it? Give them a bone to play with, and they're happy as puppies. Was it Pegram who dug up the tripod at the castle? The same man, if he wasn't his twin brother. And can you guess what he did with the tripod? He sent it to a museum in Paris. I've seen it. How can I get into the castle? Well, those walls were built specifically to stop people getting in, Mr. Stobart. But I dare say you'll find a way, if you've the will. Goodbye for now. My name's George. Pleased to meet you, mister. My name's Fitzgerald. Can I get you another drink? Oh, no, thank you. I, I shouldn't be drinking at all. I'm on tablets for my nerves. More than a pint and I'll pass out. Do you know Professor Pegram? No. 
He's the archaeologist, isn't he? That's right. Did you work at Professor Pegram's dig? <laughs> what gave you that idea? Have you heard about the gem which Pegram found? I heard a rumor, but you can't believe everything you hear or see, can you? Where can I find <laughs> Professor Pegram? I heard he's gone fishing. I don't know where. What can you tell me about the castle? There's nothing there. Just an old ruin. How old? I really couldn't tell you. Have you ever explored the castle yourself? I used to play there sometimes, when I was a kid. Then one of the little ones fell off the wall, broke his head and died. We didn't go there anymore. You haven't been up there recently? No. Do you recognize the man in this photograph? Uh, no. Uh, at least I don't think so. Look closely. He has a scar on his face. No, I'm sure I don't know him. See you later. Hey. Hello there again, mister. Do you remember seeing Sean Fitzgerald at the dig? Hmm. Let me see now. I think me brain box needs a spot of lubrication. Can I buy you a drink? You most certainly can. Give me a drink for my friend here. Who? Doyle? Has he conned you into buying for him? Shame on you, Patrick. Same again. Just a point this time, Michael. One pint of brown coming up. Do you remember Sean Fitzgerald now? I can picture the scene as if it was only last week. Come to think of it, it was only last week. Fitzgerald was there all right. Him and a bunch of students. He was speaking with the boss man. Bye for now. Excuse me. Uh, yes, sir? Hey, how about another drink? See him again? Hmm. Do you serve cocktails? I'll serve anyone with manners. And money. You know, I'm serious. Have you considered turning McDevitt's into a cocktail bar? Cocktails are chic, cool, and popular with younger drinkers. What? Kids in the bar? Can you imagine it? Pinball, pimples, and puke. Uh, right, I get the picture. I'll settle for a glass of stout. Thanks. Hello. Doyle told me you definitely worked at the dig. You don't believe him, do you? Patrick Doyle is a moron and a scoundrel. Even so, he saw you talking to Pegram. You can't prove that, mister. See you later. Hi there. What? What's your name, kid? Who are you calling, kid? Who the hell are you? I'm George Stobart, and I'm with the good guys. You're a head case, mister. A few sandwiches short of the picnic. Cut the crap and tell me your name. Liam McGuire. What are you doing hanging around the bar, McGuire? I'm on the run from me dad. Why? Did you do something bad? I ain't done nothing, boss. You can tell me, kid. Is it your dad? Oh, sir. He drinks every last penny down his evil throat. And there's me poor old mother, bedridden and dying of presumption. I tried to buy her medicine. Chopped firewood for father Mahoney till me fingers bled. The old scum. Skin Flint cheated me too, but I took the pennies he gave me back home. Look, ma, says I, 
See what your darling son has earned with his own sweat and blood. When suddenly, me dad appears and grabs the loot. I'm off to Dublin, heavy drinking, says he. Watch out till I get back. That's why I runned away. Something in the grin on his face told me he wasn't being strictly truthful. Compared to him, Huckleberry Finn was a candidate for Altar Boy of the Year. What can you tell me about the castle, McGuire? What do you want to know? Well, can I get inside? No. It's locked up. Does anyone live there? No. Only... What? Oh, nothing. You know something about the castle you're not telling me, don't you? No. What is it you're covering up? Is it something you're scared of? I ain't scared of nothing. I'll give you one last chance to tell me about the castle. Oh, yeah? And what if I don't? Then I'm taking you back to school. Oh. There's a ghost. It's called the Phantom of Loch Man. You're not telling me you believe in ghosts, are you? Mister, I seen it with me very own eyes. Last Tuesday night, I went up to see what that dig was about. I just reached the top of the wall when I hears this awful noise. What sort of noise? A horrible snuffling and snorting, like O'Brien's pig, only worse. It was coming from inside the castle. Did you find out what was making the noise in the castle? No fear. I just sat there on the wall like Humpty Dumpty. The moon was cracked and greasy like an old dinner plate. The yard was full of shadows that could have been hiding anything. I would have gone home, but me legs had lost their stuffing. Did you get to see the ghost? Indeed I did. And a fearsome sight it is too. I sat on me ass, waited while the moon went down. Then out it comes from the shadows, all grey and tattered and hunched over like an old bent willow. Then I hears this spluttering and splashing and horrible laughter in the dark. I was so scared. Why, I fell off the bloody wall. I'm sure there's a rational explanation for what you saw at the castle. There is. The bloody place is haunted. Have you seen a guy dressed as a clown? Here in Loch Marne, they all dress like clowns. The man I'm looking for is a dangerous psychotic. Jesus, it's just like that film I saw. Did this clown see? And he's after this kid who saw him kill a guy. He tries to warn the sheriff, only no one believes him. Then, while he's in the tub, the clown cuts him up with a chainsaw. My God, that doesn't sound suitable for a kid like you. Who are you calling a kid? I'm 25. Yeah, right. You're not a day over 14. Oh, no, it's 25 that I am. Married with a car and three kids. Ten kids if you count the wives. Do you know a man called Pegram? Can you describe him like on the telly in the cop shows? He's an English archaeologist. I know the man you mean if he's the one. Can you tell me where I'd find Pegram? No, I can't, because he's not here now. But if I seize him, I'll ask him. Do you know what Pegram was doing in the castle? Digging for buried treasure. Jewels and gold and skeletons, like in the films. Do you know anything about Pegram's dig? He wouldn't let me anywhere near it. I offered to help, but he chased me off. I didn't want to see his smelly old hole anyhow. Did anyone from the village work at the dig? Pegram bought some students and bums with him. He reckoned no one in Loch Marne would know what to look for. The only local guy who worked for him was Sean Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald says he's never been anywhere near the dig. He's having you on, mister. Are you sure Fitzgerald worked at the dig? Oh, yes. It was him, all right. Would I tell a lie? Well, he denies it. I saw them together only last night. I wish you'd told me that sooner. What were they doing? Pegram gave Fitzy a box. He didn't look too happy about it. I knew it. But how am I going to persuade him to part with it? 
break his fingers. Nah, I couldn't do that. Oh, I could. Thanks for the offer, kid, but I'll try a more subtle approach. Chinese burns? What's Fitzgerald scared of? Everything and everyone. So I shouldn't have any trouble getting him to talk? He's a pushover, but don't scare him too much. Try the soft touch. Butter him up a bit. I heard that Pegram had found a legendary gem. That's right. It's been the talk of Loch Man all week. You haven't seen the gem, have you? Hell no. I reckon Pegram made off with it. If I was him, I'd go to Amsterdam, chop it up and sell it. He could be living the life of Riley instead of digging holes. Have you ever seen this man before? What a slimy character. No, I never seen him. Give me your hand. Get lost. Oh, come on. I just want to show you a little trick. No way, mister. I don't do tricks. Father Mahoney told me I'd burn in hell if I did. I just want to shake your hand, that's all. Oh, all right. Gotcha. Neat, huh? Didn't feel a thing. See you later, kid. Okay, mister. Hello. McGuire says he saw you working at the dig. What's more, he saw you talking with Pegram. I knew this would happen. I knew I'd get caught. Just my luck. Grasped up by a delinquent and a dimwit. I need to talk to Professor Pegram, if he's still alive. What do you mean? Is he in danger? Yeah, you too, if I'm right. You're not from the Social Security. Hell no. What makes you think that? Well, uh, I was claiming benefit at the same time I was working for Pegram. I'm not in a position to make judgments, Sean. That's between you and your conscience. All I want is to talk to Pegram about the gem. But he's not here! I know that. But he left that package with you, didn't he? What did Pegram find at the castle? The entrance to an underground chamber. It was filled with earth and rubble, and Pegram had us dig it out. We uncovered a secret room, a hidden chapel. Did Pegram find the gem in the altar room? I don't know. He made us leave and wouldn't tell us why. Half an hour later he came out, white as a sheet he was. He closed down the dig and locked up the castle, sent us all away. From the sound of it, Pegram had discovered more than just the gem. So where did Pegram go? I don't know. I swear it. He came to see me early this morning. Said he was leaving. He asked me to give this package to a guy called Marque. Show me what's in the package, Sean. I can't do that. Why not? I promised the professor. So what? You didn't have any qualms about your benefit scam. So where's the harm in taking a peek inside Pegram's package? You don't know these people. I can't. I don't dare. This is your last chance to show me the package, Fitzgerald. I've been patient with you, but now it's time to kick ass. But he'll kill me. Who will? The man from Paris, Jack Marquet. Pegram told me if I gave him the package unopened, I'd hear no more about it. But if I double-crossed Marquet, I'd be dead. I'll deal with Jacques Marquet. Give the package to me. No. Why should I trust you? I don't know who to trust anymore. I wish I'd never even heard of the Lockmarn gem. I just seen 
little big red. Get out of here, Maguire. Come back when you're old enough. What's the lad howling about? A big red sports car. Sean Fitzgerald's been run over. Get out! Noisy little tyke. Maybe you should send out some medicinal brandy, Michael. Oh, yes. And who's going to pay for it? Not me. Me too, neither. I was telling the truth about Fitzy, mister. Okay, okay, calm down. Now tell me what happened. I was standing here, minding me own business, when I saw this beautiful red sports car coming up over the hill. Would you look at that, says I, and I going over to take a closer look. Next thing, Fitzy comes tearing out of the pub and nearly knocks me on me ass, but the car just flies at him. It was too fast for poor old Fitzy, and hit him an awful wallop. He goes flying up on top. Jesus, says I. I thought he was a goner. Next thing, the driver hops out, and I couldn't believe my eyes. He was dressed like a bloody pixie. Did this pixie have a scar on his cheek? I couldn't see. He was wearing a stupid mask. Are you a special agent? Sorry to disappoint you, kid, but I'm not. I'm just an ordinary guy caught up in a whirlpool of intrigue. And you're drunk. Not so. Yeah, you've been drinking mucky beer in the boozer. Only a few glasses. Did Fitzgerald drop anything when he was hit? I didn't see. It all happened so fast. See you later, kid. Okay, mister. The plastic cover had been smashed by the pixie's car, revealing a switch. I pushed the switch down, but in doing so, it snapped off in my hand. The gates were made of solid, age-blackened wood. Pushing with all my strength got me nowhere. They didn't budge. I really need to start working out. On the back of the cart was a crazily stacked tower of hay bales, leaning precariously against the castle wall. The farmer's craggy face was set in a mask of aesthetic appreciation. His feet were set in a pair of manure-caked boots. Hi. Do you speak English? Well, no, uh... What if I was to say no? An implication of cognizance shrouded in denial. A pretty poser of a paradox indeed. I gave him the look I'd perfected when I was 12 and was going to be the greatest hypnotist of all time. It was a killer. Are you attempting to hypnotize me, or is it the constipation you're suffering? I was a little out of practice. Good book? A book? It's a passport to a world of fantasy and imagination. Yeah? What's the title? Creative Shelfing for Beginners, the 1978 edition. What's so cool about home improvement? There's nothing like it. The resinous autumnal aroma of seasoned wood, the rhythmic rasp of the play. Ah, no wonder our Lord came to Earth as the son of a humble carpenter. I bet he was a wizard with a chisel and a length or two before. Surely the betrayal of Christ's adoptive family as humble artisans is a symbolic metaphor. I don't know about that. 
but I know they were carpenters. Haven't you read the book? Well, no. But I have seen the greatest story ever told, and I don't recall Jesus putting up any shelves. Did you happen to see a red sports car down on the road? I caught a glimpse of a flash of red on the hill and heard the racket. Sure, it was an awful noise. A sports car, you say? A Ferrari, to be exact. A racing car? And what was it doing here? The poor fella must have been lost. The driver of the Ferrari was involved in an accident. Is that so? Yeah. He knocked somebody down outside the bar. What an idiot! How could a thing like that happen? He was traveling too fast. So fast, he ran right under the car? I mean, the car was traveling too fast. But you'd have thought the idiot could have heard it coming. Maybe you know the guy who was hit by the Ferrari. His name is Sean Fitzgerald. Oh, I know him all right. That's me nephew, the idiot responsible for the stacking of my hay cart. Was he killed by the car? Oh, no. But he has been abducted. Well, that's a relief now. Aren't you going to look for your nephew? What for? From what you say, it's too late. Well, you could report the matter to the police. Better not. Besides, what could they do? Well, they could mount a search. They have only the one bicycle between them. In a question of superior acceleration, I put me money on the Ferrari. I think you ought to know exactly what Sean has gotten himself into. I'm not sure I want to know. But you're his uncle, his own flesh and blood. You're right, but what can I do? If I'm not here to guard it, some idiot might try to climb the haystack. What a moral dilemma. Stay here and guard this potentially lethal agricultural construction. Or to go off in search of the prodigal nephew, the very man responsible for said hazard? It'll need some thinking about. Why, there's no problem. You're right. Why didn't I think of it before? We'll demolish the haystack. You don't have to demolish the haystack to go look for Sean. I'll stay here in your place and warn anyone who's silly enough to climb it. Marvelous! I think I should start me inquiries in the bar. He strode off in the direction of McDevitt's bar, leaving me to contemplate the stack of hay. The stack of hay stopped short of the top of the wall. Even if I stretched as far as I could, the wall was out of reach. What I needed was a slice or two of Alice's Wonderland. There was a narrow crack between two of the stones where the centuries-old mortar had crumbled away. I inserted the end of the lifting key in the mortarless crack and gave it a firm shove. It remained lodged in the wall, jutting out to form a step. It was the fiercest, meanest-looking old goat I'd ever laid eyes upon. It was a rusted piece of iron, maybe part of a plow or something. Hey, Billy. The animal fixed on me with an evil glare. Behind the malice and resentment, there was a cool intelligence. How you doing, boy? I felt as threatened as I'd been by the assassin and his goons in Paris.
The rope by which the goat was tethered had become tangled on the old plowshare. I tried in vain to move the panel. The sack contained a fine white powder. As I dipped my fingers into the soft white powder, I realized what it was. Plaster of Paris. I'd used it in kindergarten to make casts of animal paw prints. It was a statue which had fallen from its place on the wall. Five fingers of stone projected from the back of the carving. There was a pattern of five holes arranged on the wall. They'd been drilled there deliberately. I placed my fingers and thumb into the holes in the wall. Nothing happened. The statue was too heavy to lift. It overbalanced into the sand. As I swung the stone upright, I noticed it had left a pattern of holes in the sand. I placed my fingers in the five impressions left by the fallen stone. It was weird. They fit perfectly. I sprinkled the plaster on the sand until the holes were filled. The patch of sand where the statue had fallen was covered with a dense sprinkling of plaster. The farmer was drinking and chatting with his pals as if nothing had happened. Maybe abduction had replaced cattle raiding as their national pastime. Excuse me. Uh, yes, sir? Do you know Sean Fitzgerald very well? I know him enough not to sell him more than two pints. He's like a kid when he gets a few beers inside him. I'm not surprised. He's on medication. For his nerves. There's nothing wrong with his nerves. He's just screwy. Give me another beer, dude! Give everyone another beer! Let's party, guys! I think you've had enough, don't you? Hey, listen. Is it supposed to taste the way it does? Go Pauline Stilt is brewed from the finest chemicals in the world.
I'm sorry, but the pump appears to be broken. I could fix it for you. I don't think so. This is a job for a professional electrician. Oh well, at least the glass washer is still working. It's not my dear, is it? It just so happens I'm an electrician. Check out my credentials. Well, no. Isn't that marvelous? <laughs> Here's a house bedeviled with faulty wiring of a wayward nature. Here's you, an electric man, with a little plastic card to prove it. Hmm. I still want to see what you can do before I let you touch me beer pumps. You can make a start on the glass washer. <laughs> And when you finish that, will you take a look at the pumps? There was nothing physically wrong with the glass washer. I used all my knowledge of electrical engineering to examine the plug. Seemed fine to me. Almost as if he'd sensed my intentions, the old derelict snatched the wire from the table. As soon as the old guy looked away, I grabbed his piece of wire. I replaced the fuse with a piece of wire. I knew it was dangerous but I was desperate enough to disregard everything I knew about standard safety precautions. Excuse me, Mr. Leary. I fixed your glass washer, no problem. Bingo, and a blessing to all the saints. A free half pint to that man on the house. Now, could you take a look at the beer pumps? Well, I guess so, but I'm not making any promises. If you can't fix them, I'll have a riot on me hands. The pumps are in the cellar, right? That's right. You'll find a flashlight down there somewhere. What a dumb place to store a flashlight. A dark cellar. The only way I was going to find anything down there was to feel around. My hand closed on a long metal rod. I pushed the lever and heard the grating of metal, but nothing appeared to happen. It was a beer-stained piece of toweling. The man's arm lay across the towel, preventing me from moving it. As the man raised his arm to drink, I snatched the towel away. I lifted the trap door and an overpowering smell of stale beer rose from the cellar below. I looked down on a stone tiled floor, way too far to jump. Excuse me. There was a nasty feeling in my guts I usually associated with light opera. 
It was Khan. What's the problem? Did you see what happened here a few minutes ago? What was that? A man was involved in an unfortunate accident. I didn't see anything. What about the boy? Uh, he doesn't know anything either. The kid, well, you know how it is in these rural communities. Not enough genes to go around. I prayed McGuire had the sense to keep his mouth shut. Was the guy hurt bad? He's been taken care of, but he thinks he dropped a small parcel. You didn't happen to find it, did you? If I had, I would have taken it to the police. Of course. Thank you. Then I noticed a flash of light, something sparkling beneath the open trap door. It was Pegram's gem, all right. A large, uncut blue stone. As I held it aloft, I realized the fascination it could command. I guess I was already under its spell. Did you find it? What? Whatever you was looking for. Uh, yeah. Listen, McGuire. I want you to keep this to yourself. No problemo. Just chuck us up a crate of lager. No way. You're not old enough. We can sell it and make some cash. Forget it, kid. I couldn't betray Mr. Leary's trust. I could. For sure. That old misery guts deserves it. If you want to do me a favor, keep a lookout for that guy in the suit. Okay, but it'll cost you a pack of the chips. Oh, and shout if you see that Ferrari. It was a couple of paper sacks filled with trash. It was a calendar with a faded photograph of a prize-winning carp. I tried to pull the lever, but it wouldn't move with the trap door open. I looked among the cleaning materials, but saw nothing I could use. The faucet creaked, coughed, and spewed out a stream of rusty colored water. I held the towel under the faucet and soaked it with water. The towel was already as wet as it was going to get.
the trickle of water was quickly absorbed by the plaster. I eased the solid piece of plaster from the sand. Underneath, it had formed a perfect copy of the statue. The hardened plaster cast fitted snugly into the five matching sockets. There was a soft thud, then silence. A flight of stairs led down into darkness. So, where did you stay last night? At McDevitt's. I got to drinking with Doyle and a couple of the guys. That explains why you look so ill today. Did you get any sleep at all? Not much. I had to share the room with another guy. Did he snore? Hardly. He was dead. Then Leary woke me in the middle of the night to help bail out the cellar. The cellar was flooded? Yeah. Some idiot had left the faucet running. And you say P. Graham has disappeared? without a trace. But my visit wasn't a complete waste of time. P. Graham's gem? The Templar's gem. Whoever Jacques Marquet is, he's in for a disappointment. Jacques Marquet? He's the guy who should have collected the gem from Fitzgerald. What are your plans? I want to find out who, what, or where Montfaucon was. All I've got to go by is the name and a picture of a hanged man. Do you want to look after the gem? No, Georges. I'd be too tempted to sell it. Look, Nico. A handful of plaster. Yeah. Why is it that men never really grow up? What's your problem, sister? Your pockets stuffed with useless junk like little boys. You never know when useless junk might come in handy. I can't sit here all day, much as I'd like to. Okay. Don't forget to look for Lobino at the Kron Museum. And why don't you see if Rosso has heard anything? Okay. Anything else I can do for you while I'm out? Shopping, a trip to the laundromat? Just take care of yourself. <laughs> 